Well, welcome again, and uh, wanted to let you know this morning that Pastor Mark is uh, out in Door County today, and actually this week with his family, enjoying a week of vacation. Uh, they had a, quite a bit of sickness going through their household last week, and thankfully all healed up, and so they're able to enjoy that week of vacation that they're on today. And so uh, I'll be bringing the message this morning, uh, and, and as many of you know, anytime that I preach, I'd like to take a quick moment before I get too far into the sermon to just share a few pictures uh, of my family, and, uh, and so I'm going to do that right now, and I'd like to just start with a picture of Cade. Uh, there he is. He's, that's Cade, our youngest son. He's uh, four and a half months old. He was born on October 1st, and he has been a wonderful addition to our family, and every day uh, just more and more joy to our family while being able to raise him up. And so that's Cade. Uh, there's the next picture is uh, Garrison holding Cade, uh, and that's Garrison, our oldest. He's five years old, and uh, they love their little brother sometimes too much. Uh, they like to hold him and squeeze him and jump on top of him and wrestle with him, as many of you probably know that have children. So it makes for an interesting household. And then the last picture is uh, Josiah, very proud of his little brother there, Cade. And so that's Josiah. He's three years old. So we have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a newborn. And uh, thank you for your prayers. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, specifically, just pray for my wife. I'm, you know, I, I work a lot and I have a busy job, and she's, uh, she works harder and longer than I do taking care of those three in our household. So we're very thankful for your prayer and also for your support of our family. Like I said, uh, whenever I get up here and share these pictures, I, I do it because I feel like this is our family here at Bayside. And uh, on that note, I just was thinking about this. Uh, Kevin, I just saw you. Uh, seven years ago, this weekend is when my wife and I came to Canada date here at Bayside. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was negative 45 degrees wind chill that weekend, and I don't know why we came. <laughs> it certainly wasn't for the weather, right? I know why we came. This was a, a this is a wonderful church, and uh, we knew right from the get-go, when from the first people we met and everything that we did in interacting with the church, that this is where God was calling us to be. And uh, boy, I just remember that weekend of being so, so cold. And people warned us, it doesn't get much warmer even in the summertime. Sometimes it snows in June, and it's really miserable at times. But boy, we really love it here. And uh, as much as the weather can be bothersome at this time of year, especially in February and March. It's a great place to be and a great family to be a part of here at this church. And so I'm glad to be here and I'm also glad that you are a part of this congregation uh, because it's the people that make this congregation so wonderful. So thank you for that and thank you for your support of our family. Well, currently we're in a series uh, called The Basics with a Twist. And Pastor Mark and I have been sharing these messages since the beginning of this new year, 2013. And we've kind of had three parts to this series, and with those three parts, there will be three challenges, and we've kind of presented some of those. And all of this comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. <clears throat> and so we've kind of studied through that, and the first part of the Back to the Basics series was reading God's Word reading God's word. And so we made a little challenge to, uh, to, to our congregation here at Bayside to read through the entire Bible in 2013. And as you can see there, we have 240 people who have committed to read through God's word in, in 2013. And praise the Lord for that. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, we have some interaction through email groups. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about that as we've done it. It's not too late to join. Uh, you can still certainly catch up or just do it a year from now until a year from now. It doesn't really matter. We just want more people reading God's word because we think it's really good. And so join us in that if you want. There's more information at the Welcome Center uh, if you'd like to join us. But we have 179 people reading through the Bible over the whole course of the year, 47 that are going to do it over 180 days, which is half the year, and then 14 people who are doing that in 90 days, which is just about up. They only have about a month left. So um, 240 total that are doing that. And that was our first part of the back to the basics, to really get back to reading God's word. And so we want to encourage you, whether or not you're, you're joining us in this challenge to read through the whole Bible, to really get back into God's word. The second part of the back to the basics series was prayer. And we talked about how can we be uh, praying more, and we talked about it from this specific verse in Ephesians 6, 18, how can we pray for all of the saints? And we made a challenge to pray for every single saint, every single Christian in the world. And so we're doing that nation by nation, praying for every single nation, every single Christian in the world uh, throughout this entire year. And so as you can see there, we have 172 
of you that have committed to do that with us, and we have, uh, you can join up in that too, and it is not too late to do that. It's never too late to pray. Uh, we have the information at the Welcome Center as well, and there's a little uh, worksheet there that has the dates. We're specifically, as a congregation, praying for a specific nation every day, and sometimes we don't have to because there's not 365 nations, uh, but we pray almost every day, you know, usually the weekdays, and we pray for a different nation together, and we're lifting up the saints of that nation each day. And so we encourage you to join us in that. The, the information is at the Welcome Center, uh, and you can sign up for that, and you can also get an email with more information, more resources on the internet if you're interested in that. Uh, but we encourage you, again, whether you're going to join us in that endeavor or not, to just be praying more, to get back into the basics of reading God's Word and prayer. And then the third part of the Back to the Basics series, the Gospel. And that's what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. And so I'm going to start this morning in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. And Paul is writing and he says, uh, he's talking about praying and he says, and pray also for me that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Boldness is what we're talking about. And taking the gospel that we know, the truth of the gospel, what's inside God's word, what we believe in and what we have a heart and a passion for, the gospel that changed our lives and boldly sharing that, boldly living that out. And so we've really been talking and thinking about how can we share the gospel boldly? We want to encourage you to think, can we share the gospel with even one person this year? Are we bold enough to share the gospel with just one person? And how do we achieve boldness? What does that look like? And I've been praying about that, and Pastor Mark has, has given some messages about that, and he's shared some personal stories uh, in, in the last two weeks about when he shared the gospel boldly with some Jehovah's Witnesses and, and what that looked like in his life. And, and what I want to encourage you this morning is to start thinking as we're talking about sharing the gospel, we're talking about the power of the gospel, what hopefully has changed your life, start thinking about maybe somebody in your life who you could share the gospel with, who you could share this unbelievable transformation in your life with, and that maybe that person could see that same transformation, could see the amazing gospel in their life. As I prayed about that, and as I was preparing for, for this week and the possibility of preaching about that and thinking about all the stories and, and living out the gospel and stories of, of times when I've shared the gospel, uh, a verse in a, a section of scripture I came across that I was studying was in Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. And I, I want to encourage you to open up your Bible to this section. Uh, you can follow along on the screens if you want this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in front of you. And open up to Philippians. Uh, this is kind of where we're going to be at this morning, and this is where I'm going to be preaching from today. And I just want to read through this, this, this section of Scripture, it's just four verses. And I want to start just talking and thinking about how the gospel can be played out in our lives. So join me as we read through Philippians chapter 1. Verses 27 through 30. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by our opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now that you hear that I still have. Wow, what does that look like in our lives today? There's a lot there in those four verses. And, and as you read through that, as you heard that, and as we talk about this morning, I just want you to think about how does that apply to me? And not me up here, but you. How does that apply to you? Does your manner of life, is your manner of life worthy of the gospel? Are you standing firm in one spirit? Are you frightened by your opponent? Is there fear in your life? Are you suffering for the sake of the gospel? Are you engaged in conflict over the gospel? These are all things that we're going to talk about this morning. These are things that, that we may learn 
while we live out the gospel boldly. And actually, as I read through this verse and I started thinking about a couple of specific times when I really felt compelled to share the gospel, it really related, I really related to this, this verse and to these verses and these points that come out of these verses. Because there's always some things that we learn in living out the gospel boldly. And these are just some things that I learned that come straight out of this verse. And I wanna share them with you today in hopes that maybe you can see how these can be played out in your own life. And when I, when I think about sharing the gospel, there's always one specific story that comes to my mind. And that's of a guy named Adam. Adam was a guy that I met in college, actually. Uh, he was the same age as me, but uh, he started coming to the college that I went to during my junior year in college. And Adam was, uh, he was a great guy. He was a basketball player. He was a city boy. He came from the city of Los Angeles. And he grew up in gangs. He was uh, a, a kid that didn't go to church growing up. He went to college for one reason and one reason only, to play basketball. And he came to the college that I went to in the middle of Nebraska. He was from Los Angeles, California, the city, and now he was in college in the middle of Nebraska, a small Christian college in the middle of a bunch of cornfields, and he was there to play basketball. And that was the story of, of Adam. He had uh, no, no introduction to a Christian life before coming to York College in Nebraska. And he had never even opened up a Bible in his entire life, never been to church. And this was Adam. And th when I think about this story, and I'm going to kind of share the story that I interacted with Adam throughout my junior year in college, I'm just amazed at how God really made the gospel alive in my life during that time. And another story that comes to mind uh, is another one of my life is a guy named Josh. And these are two separate people, two different stories from two, two different times in my life. But Josh was a guy that I met uh, after I graduated from college, actually in about the year 2003, 2004. I had gotten a job at a, a financial institution, which is the wonderful industry that I worked in before I came into the awesome ministry and working for the church. Uh, the financial institution in, in the Minneapolis area, and Josh was a guy who, uh, he hated religion. He was very skeptical of Christianity, and he bluntly was against Christianity. And we had grown to know each other through sitting, I, he was actually my uh, cubicle partner. We shared a cubicle together, and we would just talk about anything and everything, the weather and sports and uh, movies or whatever else, and we started to build a relationship there. And um, the story that I have and that I've learned uh, about the gospel and sharing the gospel with Josh is, is one that changed my life forever. Both of these two stories of Adam and Josh. And, and as I think about these two different people and the two different interactions that I had with these guys in sharing the gospel and living out the gospel in my life, I really realized that I did have to stand firm in one spirit. And that's kind of the first thing that comes out of this section of scripture in verse 27. It says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. You see, Adam was this big basketball player, and all he cared about was basketball. And I could very easily try to, you know, mention something about my faith. And it was, it was easy because we were on a Christian campus, and so it wouldn't have been hard to just start talking about God or to bring that up or to invite him to a devotional or to church because that was the culture at a Christian campus. But still, this background that he had, he, was growing, he grew up in gangs and was just a very rough around the edges type of a guy, made it very hard to share the gospel with him. And it was very afraid to even bring it up and to talk about it. But I knew that I had to stand firm in the spirit. I knew that God had put me into his life as a friend that I had, you know, I had met him at the beginning of the school year, as somebody that God would use to maybe bring the gospel into his life. And so I had to stand firm in the spirit. And in the same way with Josh, it was a guy that I worked with. And this was not a Christian environment. It was a worldly environment. And there's some rules and boundaries that are out there about talking about God and talking about Jesus. And, you know, it's a no-no. And especially, this was 10 years ago, especially now, it's a no-no. You're not supposed to talk about these things. And so it was difficult. But I learned that I had to stand firm in one spirit. And Adam, this guy Adam, he was a basketball player I mentioned. He's six foot nine. And he's probably one of the strongest people I've ever met. Just a big, strong, bulky, muscular guy. 
and he was so scary. And he actually, uh, I, was, I was involved in a, in a fraternity, and at a Christian campus, it's not really a fraternity, so please don't go there as far as what fraternities are. It was more of a social club. And this, this was a, I was a part of this, and I actually was the president of the, the fraternity during my junior year. And Adam uh, signed up to become a part of our fraternity, and so we had to go through the whole uh, hazing week, or what, initiation is what they called it. And, and so, you know, during that, there's some of the things that we do during that, or we like yell at the initiates and kind of get them all excited and all that stuff. And we, we did uh, make them like memorize verses and, and things like that, but we'd also make them do push-ups and, and physical activities and things like that to, to kind of initiate them into our group. And there was nothing weird or illegal or any of that, I promise you that. I was a Christian campus and, and I was a Christian leading and being the president of this fraternity social club. But so it was a little intimidating to get up in front of a six foot nine muscular huge basketball player and yell at him and then also tell him to get down and do push-ups. It was very intimidating. In fact, I was very afraid of what might happen or that he would decide he didn't want to be yelled at anymore. And I remember specifically one time, he just like rattled off like 100 push-ups without even thinking. He just was pushing, pushing, pushing. And he got up and then we were, you know, telling, they had to memorize these verses. And so I'm like, you know, yelling at him to memorize verses. And he didn't know any scripture. And this is when I found out that he had never even opened up a Bible in his entire life. And as I'm yelling at him, and, and as we're yelling at him and doing all this stuff for the initiation, kind of hazing this guy, there's just this fear that he's not going to accept who we are, that are we really representing the gospel in what we're doing? And I just had all these fears going over my head. And I was frightened. I was frightened. And again, I've learned, and I learned from this verse, to not be frightened by our opponent. And when we're sharing the gospel, and we're preparing to share the gospel, and I don't know what that'll look like in your life, and I don't know who it is that God's going to put on your heart to share the gospel with, you might come to a place where you're afraid. And it may be because of the physical nature of things, or it may be just because you're afraid to do it. And I certainly had a lot of fear going into that situation. Uh, and in the same way with, with Josh, I had a fear of sharing my faith with him because of where we weren't, because of the skepticism that he had. Uh, and we started these conversations. We started meeting actually for lunch. And for lunch, you could leave the office. And so we'd go downtown Minneapolis and through the Skyway, and we'd, we'd go to restaurants, or we'd just go and find a table to sit at and, and bring a lunch from home, and we'd start talking. And I started praying, because I was afraid, because I knew now that we were out of the office place, now I had the freedom to start talking about the gospel and to really share what Jesus Christ did in my life. And I was afraid. I was afraid that he would be skeptical. I was afraid that he would make fun of me. I, would, I was afraid that it would jeopardize our friendship. I was afraid that it would jeopardize my job. And I even questioned what I was doing. And on top of all that, he was very critical. Josh was so skeptical of the gospel and so critical of Christianity. And once he found out that I was a Christian, he used that as a, as a nagging point. You know how you are with friends. You kind of make fun of them. You like to enjoy joking around with your friends. And so he'd just make fun of me about being a Christian. And he'd take all the negative things about Christianity that he knew and just poke me with them and just make fun of me. And so there was this great fear of failure, of being denied and I had this fear, and I've, I've learned to not be frightened by our opponent. To not be frightened by our opponent. To stand firm in one spirit. And also to suffer for his sake. Verse 29. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Suffer for his sake. I don't know what that looks like for you. But for me, I was suffering in both of these two situations. I was suffering. Because I was not sure with, with Josh if I was going to be able to continue in this workplace environment. And I was not sure if I'd get fired. I was not sure because I was so nervous about how the way he was skeptical and the way that he made fun of me. That at any moment, he could have gone and told my boss and had me fired. And I was praying over that during this time. And during it, I just knew that I could not stop and that I had to stand firm. And one verse that comes to mind was 2 Timothy 1.8. It 
And it says this, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And when I understood and realized the truth in that verse, to not be ashamed of the gospel, to not be ashamed of what God has done in my life, the transformation, the change, the amazing power and the glory that I've seen happen in my life, the way that my life took a different direction when I finally truly gave my life over to Christ, to not be ashamed of that. There was a whole new freedom when I came to that point, when I realized that I needed not be ashamed. And every single one of us is going to struggle with that at one point or another because that's what stops us from sharing the gospel. And maybe we're not ashamed, but we're afraid. And I think if we're afraid, if we're afraid then maybe we are ashamed because of what the gospel is looked at by our world, because of how God is viewed by our world, because of how Jesus Christ is viewed by our world, because of our place in the world, our stature, our job, our status, our friendships, all of those things play into the fact that we can be afraid and we can be ashamed and in that we will suffer. And are you willing to suffer for the sake of Christ? Because I want to tell you, if you start praying now and start thinking about sharing the gospel, it is not going to be easy. And I, I'm assuming that if you're a human being, you probably already are thinking about that and, and maybe a little bit worried about it. Because all of us have that little bit of that fear. I don't, I've never met anybody that's just so crazy that they're just going to go, okay, I've met a couple of people. <laughs> I've met a couple of people. They, they're crazy. And they're, and they're very evangelical, and that's great, but there's some of them that get very extreme. And Mark talked about that in the last couple of weeks. Obnoxiousness is not part of the boldness that we see in the scripture. We don't need to be obnoxious. We don't need to stand on the street corners. We don't need to be crazy. But we do need to share the gospel. And we can't be afraid. We can't be ashamed of what God has done in our lives and how he has changed our lives. Like I said with Josh, I was at a risk of public humiliation. I was at a risk of workplace humiliation. And I came to a point where I had to just take the risk. I had to go for it and say, you know what? The gospel is more important than my job. The gospel is more important than this friendship. The gospel is more important than what my coworkers think of me. The gospel is more important. Jesus is more important. And because of those decisions, I certainly began to engage in conflict over the gospel. Verse 30, Paul says, actually I'm going to read 29 again, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Conflict. Whenever we bring up the gospel in this world, there's going to be conflict. As I said a few weeks ago when I preached um, about reading God's word and, and about that, that it, it can be offensive. God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive to the world that we live in. And you certainly will experience in sharing the gospel times of engaging in conflict because of how people respond to it, because of how people react to it. And see, Adam, Adam, when I was in college, he ended up joining our fraternity and, and coming to our meetings. And in our meetings, we would have Bible studies and we would have prayer times and we'd have other times where we'd go and support the other members of our, of our fraternity at their different athletic events. I was a soccer player, so a lot of the guys in our fraternity would dress up and come to the soccer games and, and cheer me on and the other teammates of mine that were a part of our fraternity. And so we did the same thing when Adam came to basketball season. We'd all go to the basketball games and cheer him on. And he was a great basketball player. In fact, he got recruited in. Obviously, we had to recruit him to come from California. And he was one of the best players on the team and was a, a huge part of the team. And they had this great success. And unfortunately, the conflict of the gospel started to come up in his life. You see, he had never lived according to the gospel. He's hearing these things and we're trying to influence him and share these things with him. But he still had this life that he had grown up and lived with, and he still was 
drinking and, and wanting to be going to parties and these other things, which still happen at Christian campuses, unfortunately. And so he ended up getting in some trouble. And I don't need to go into the details, but he got in trouble during the basketball season and had a little conflict of behavior. And I think that was a turning point for Adam because he realized that the things that he was doing and that the things that he was used to and the things that he grew up with were conflicting with the things that he was now learning. And that if he was going to choose the gospel and choose Christ, he was going to have to change his ways. And there was this inner conflict in him. And during all of this, was, as all this was happening throughout the year, a friend of mine, Luke, who was also a part of our group, just were, we were, we, Luke and I both were praying together for Adam and, and meeting with him on different occasions. And, and we did everything we could in, in, in helping him. And when he had this conflict and got in this trouble, we talked to him and kind of told him what, what it means to be a Christian and a believer. And we shared all these things with him. And in the same way with Josh, the conflict was that our friendship was jeopardized. And when I talked about, any time I talked about my faith, and when I began talking about my faith with him and I decided I was not going to be afraid and I wasn't going to be ashamed and I was going to take that risk, our conversations just weren't the same anymore. And we stopped having lunch together. And he ended up moving to a different department, still for the same company on a different floor. So we just didn't talk as often. And he kind of cut off communication. It was less, uh, less conversations and more just, hey, how you doing? How's the weather? Yeah, I saw the big game last night. And when you share the gospel, at some point, you're going to come to a challenge point, a make or break, where you have to take a step of faith and just go out there and just do it. And not all of us are ready for that right now, but at some point, you're probably going to have to come to that point. And it's only by the grace of God and the power of the gospel that we can do these things and that we can do them with boldness. Again, going back to Ephesians chapter 6, Paul asks for, for the Ephesians to pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in, change, in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And my friend Luke and I just prayed for boldness and we asked everyone that we knew to pray for boldness. Our whole fraternity was praying for boldness. And that tipping point, that challenge point with Adam came on March 31st, 2002, Easter Sunday. And on Easter Sunday in the evening, he contacted Luke and I and asked if he could just meet up with us. And I don't even remember the whole details of the story. I don't remember if he went to church that day or not, and if he heard some part of the gospel or if they talked about the gospel in church that day. But all I know is he was really searching. And so Luke and I met with him that night, and we prayed with him, and we read scripture, and we spent time with him. And on that night, Adam chose Christ. He gave his life to Christ as we were talking about baptism and as we talked about the story with Philip and the missionary and, and all that and, and going right in to, to get baptized. And at that point, he realized, why, I don't need to wait any longer either. This is what I want with my life. I don't want the old life. I don't want to be involved in gangs. I don't want to be involved in alcohol anymore. And Adam chose Christ and he put his faith in Christ that night. We were so excited. I can't explain to you the joy, the excitement, and the amazing feeling that I had on that night when Adam chose to give his life to Jesus Christ. We were so excited about him. We were sharing with him about baptism, and he kind of did the same thing as in the story in the Bible. He said, why can't I be baptized right now? And we said, well, it is the middle of the night. It's like two in the morning. And he said, why not? And so we said, well... Why not? And so we actually called the campus minister. And he went and opened up the church. And this was at the Church of Christ, and they, don't have, you know, they have the, their uh, baptismal tank. They actually keep the water in it for occasions like this. And so the water is there. And we gathered up a few friends, woke up a few people, and we went and had a baptismal service. And I'm telling you, one of the, you know, in my life, there's probably been a handful, maybe 10, 20 times in my life where I know I felt and tasted a piece of heaven. And that certainly was one of those times, worshiping and celebrating as this guy has given his life to Christ, life transformed, a man who was this physical specimen, this scary, tough, rough around the edges guy, 
basketball player from the city of Los Angeles. And over those months from the time we met him in August until March, the transformation and the changes, because my friend Luke and because myself and because others were not afraid to share the gospel. It was powerful. One of the greatest memories I've had in my entire life, singing and celebrating, and when he was baptized, just looking over to my friend Luke and just tears coming down and just celebrating and worshiping together. What an amazing story it was. And with Josh, there was also a breaking point. And again, like I said, our conversations had changed. And uh, we had only talked about, you know, the weather or the big game last night and sometimes movies. And uh, luckily enough for me, that was around the time, 2003, 2004, if you remember, the movie The Passion of the Christ came out. And he was a big movie guy. And so in one of our conversations just about movies, we still hadn't really got our friendship back to where it once was. I actually just mentioned to him, hey, have you heard about this new movie that's all the buzz is about this movie, The Passion of the Christ? And of course, he had the skepticism like he did before. But we started talking about it. And we emailed back and forth a little bit. And we talked a little bit more about it. And eventually, we started meeting for lunch again. And we would talk about sports. But then we, I asked him again, you know, have you, have you seen this movie? Everyone's talking about it. He, he just loved movies and always wanted to go see the new biggest movie. And he said, no, I'd never seen it. And I really, you know, I don't, I'm not going to watch it. And he was very skeptical of it. And by this time, the movie was out on video. And I had the movie. And I brought it with me to work. And we went and had lunch one time because now we were starting to meet for lunch again and we were talking about sports and movies and all sorts of other stuff. And I pulled out the movie. And I said, Josh, I think you should watch this. I just think you should watch it. And I know you're very skeptical of, of Christianity and my beliefs, but I think you should watch it. And I don't know where that boldness came from. I really don't except for from here and from Jesus Christ and from Christ alone because it wasn't from me. But that boldness came from the Lord. I was very afraid the day that I brought that movie to give to him. I knew that there was risk. I knew that there could have been conflict. But I knew that I had to do it because I knew it was an opportunity it might have been a door that could be opened in his life to hear about the gospel. And so I borrowed him the movie and he took it home. And, you know, days went by where we continued to meet and we continued to talk and I never wanted to make a big deal about it. And so I didn't want to ask about it or bring it up and make a big deal about it. But I know he watched it because something changed. There was a difference in our relationship. There was a respect for my beliefs. There wasn't the same skepticism that he had before that. And our conversations were more meaningful. And he was continuing to search. But there was this huge difference. And I knew it was because he had watched the movie. And at some point, he gave it back to me. And I asked him, what did you think? And we talked about it. And he told me what he thought about it. And he didn't say that he gave his life to Christ. He didn't say that it changed his life. But I could see that there was a difference in our relationship. And like I said, a respect. And it reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, where Paul says, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. And so Paul understood that for the gospel and for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of Jesus Christ, he was going to do anything that he could for anyone that he could do it for so that just even some of the people that he interacted with or even maybe just one person that he interacted with would accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we share the gospel boldly, we can't worry about results we don't control the results. God does. We can't control other people because it is ultimately their decision. But you want to know what? That can't stop us from sharing the gospel. 
With Adam, I found success. We found success. And sometimes when we share the gospel, we will share the joy of salvation and the celebrations and the life's changed. But with Josh, it was a different story. We kept in touch, we kept our relationship going, but eventually I moved into a different job. And my wife and I moved to a different town. And we'd email back and forth occasionally, but eventually we lost touch. And our relationship slowly faded away. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know where Josh is. In fact, this last week, as I thought about this and I prayed about it, I prayed for him and I tried everything I could to look him up. I looked him up on, I tried to look him up on Facebook and on the internet and anywhere I could. I even just sent out an email to what I thought was his old email, if he still worked at that place. And about an hour later, I got an email back said that this email no longer exists. And so I don't know where Josh is. I don't know where he is in his life, and I don't know what God's done in his life, but I know that God used me to plant a seed in his life. I have to trust that I did everything that I could to share the gospel boldly. I stood firm in the spirit. I was not frightened by the opponent. I was willing to suffer for his sake, and I certainly engaged in conflict over the gospel. And I am not ashamed. And I have no regrets. There's one other key thing I want you to know about, just to remind you. During these two stories, I wasn't a pastor. Because these happened in, in, in 10 years ago, and I didn't become a pastor until, like I said, seven years ago. And so I want you to know that you don't have to be a pastor to share the gospel. You don't have to have every single answer that's in here. It helps to get back into the Bible, and it helps to study and to know it, and we can help you do that, and we can encourage you to do that, and we want to do that here at Bayside and in our church. You don't have to have every answer. I didn't have every answer. I used a movie. You don't have to have every answer. Every single one of us can share the gospel. I know that I did. And like I said, I am not ashamed. And I have absolutely no regrets. So as you've heard these stories and these verses, have you thought about it? Who do you know? With whom will you share the gospel? Hopefully a person has come to your mind as I've preached this sermon. A neighbor, a co-worker, a family member, or a friend. Just start by praying now. Pray for boldness. Get into God's word. Study the word. Get ready. But start by praying and understand that you're going to have to stand firm in the spirit. You can't be frightened by the opponent. You can't allow fear to overtake you. That you might have to suffer for his sake and that you may engage in conflict with whoever it is or with whatever situation it is if you share the gospel. But again, 1 Corinthians 9, 22. Paul says, I have become all things to all people that by all means... I might save some. And we could even just look at it as we might save one. God can save one person through you and your boldness in sharing the gospel. One, even just one. Do we have the boldness to share the gospel? Even if God could change just one life through our boldness, it would be worth every moment. Start praying for one. I promise you, you will not be ashamed and you will have no regrets. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this day, Lord. God, I pray that we would be encouraged and challenged by your word, that your word would give us boldness, that it would drive us closer to you, God, to have boldness to share your word and your truth and your gospel, Lord. And God, I pray that each one of us here today would just think about even one person with whom we could share the gospel. And God, we pray that we could be all things to all people for you and for your sake, that even just one person that we know would give over their life to you, Lord. 
And God, we will celebrate and we will worship you and we just will praise you, God. We thank you so much for this and these opportunities that you're going to bless us with. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think back to that night, March 31st, 2002. It's a memory that I will never forget. And I may not even be close to my friend Adam anymore. He lives in California still. Friends with him on Facebook and we keep in touch a little bit here and there. But the joy of knowing that Jesus Christ changed that life is a joy that I'll have until I'm in heaven celebrating with him. And as I think back on that night, worshiping and seeing him baptized and seeing this life given to Christ, there's not many greater feelings that I will ever have in my entire life. And so I pray that together we can do the same thing. We can share the gospel boldly that one life could be changed forever. Start praying now. God will put somebody on your heart. And when you're afraid, go back to him and pray. And when you're unsure, pray. And when you're unsure and you're not sure about anything, go back to the word and do whatever you can to achieve that boldness. And it may look differently in every one of our lives. And we can't control the results of the decisions. But at the end of the day, we can say we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that that'll happen in every single one of our lives. Because I'm not going to stop sharing and I hope that you won't either. So I encourage you to do that today. If you need somebody to pray with, if you want to start praying, I will pray with you right now with your, the person that you're thinking of. Come forward and pray with me. We also have prayer teams on both sides of the sanctuary. And we'd love to start praying for you and for the person that you'd like to share the gospel with. And we'll see that happen because God is good. And he is our strength when we are afraid. And so go and have a great week and start praying and sharing the gospel boldly. God bless and have a great day.